Hi everyone, my name is Anna Hicks and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Spivey Consulting Group and we are all here today to talk a little bit about character and fitness issues. Uh, so first, why don't we just go ahead and have everyone introduce themselves, just say a little bit about who you are, how long you've been with Spivey Consulting and the law school you worked at, uh, just give us an intro. Um, do we want to start with Nathan? I am the least seasoned person here, I'll claim that. I've been with Spivey for about one year now, um, and I was prior to that at the University of Houston Law Center, and then prior to that at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Buttonbaum. I uh, joined Mike uh, at Spivey Consulting uh, seven years ago, and prior to that, I worked at Harvard Law School. Uh, when I left, I was the director of admissions at Harvard. I had been there for 12 years. And prior to that, I was at uh, Roger Williams uh, University School of Law for four years. So um, I miraculously started when I was very young. <laughs> so I've been uh, in legal education, law school admissions for quite some time. Mike? So I clearly I've been with Spivey Consulting the longest <laughs> day one. <laughs> Um, I was at Vanderbilt Law School. I was at Washington University in St. Louis, and I was at Colorado Law School. This is year nine for me. And Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle Early, and this is my fifth year with Spivey Consulting. Um, prior to that, I worked with Karen at Harvard Law School. Um, and before that, I was actually in undergrad admissions at both Harvard College and Clark University. So this is 20 years, I think, in admissions. So. Wow. I also started very, very young like that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Wonderful. Thank you all. Um, so I did just want to start by broadly defining what is character and fitness? What are character and fitness issues? We'll get into specific examples soon, but does anyone want to just sort of give a broad overview? Sure. I'd be happy to do that. Um, so every law school is going to be asking some form of character and fitness questions on their application. Um, every bar, uh, every state bar will also be asking character and fitness questions. So these are often reflective of the types of questions that you'll be asked when you apply for the state bar um, after you graduate from law school. So at the ad admissions phase, the admissions officers want to be aware of any potential issues that may come up. And so they ask questions um, about academic misconduct, academic um, behavior issues, um, criminal issues, um, things that are going to, that potentially can affect your admission to the bar exam, but they also reflect your character and fitness to practice law. So it's really important to look at each school's individual questions because there, while there are a lot of similarities and they're all looking for kind of the same thing, the wording on each of those questions is gonna be different and distinct at each law school. So it's really important to read each question carefully uh, to understand what they're asking and to disclose fully because some states will look at your application to law school when you apply for the bar exam and if the questions don't match up there could be problems um, so it's a really important part of the application process but for the most part it's you know nothing to stress about you just need to be honest about it so the one thing that I would add to that is at the um, point where you're enrolling in a particular law school, you are going to have a lot of forms that you're going to fill out. One of those is going to be a form that you're going to send to your undergraduate institution or your graduate institutions uh, that will go to the dean's office that will um, sign off on your character and fitness questions as well as pertaining to that institution. So um, when you're enrolling at a school, they are going to follow up and um, confirm the information that you've been sending along. And sometimes that information will not match what you have because yes. schools sometimes expunge records after you graduate. That does not mean that you should, you should answer the questions any differently than as they are asked. So let's talk a little bit about assessing the seriousness of these character and fitness issues. And you started to talk a little bit about that. But Mike, I know you in particular get a ton of messages on you know Twitter, Reddit, email, uh, with folks who are just really worried about how they're going to have to answer this question or whether they should answer this question in a certain way. Um, 
So can can you talk a little bit about that, just about generally sort of assessing the seriousness of these issues? Yeah, this is the greatest starting point because you're right, I do 365 days a year get get some form of question. You know, can you assess this thing in my past and tell me how it's going to hurt my application? In 98 to 99 out of every 100 one of these I get, it really doesn't impact the applicant's application. But th- there's two variables that go into why. So why are people emailing a complete stranger, in this case me, and saying, you know, does this, tr- do these three speeding tickets from five years ago, are they, am I doomed from the T whatever? And I think it's like the, I hate the expression perfect storm. It's way overused. So it's the atmospheric confluence <laughs> of two horrible things coming together at once. One is, unless you've done law school admissions before, which is essentially no one applying to law school, everything is mysterious to you and out of your control. It seems out of your control because you have no experience in doing it. You don't get nervous if you get on a bike the hundredth time, but you get nervous the first time you get on your bike. The second point, which is even more psychologically, I think, gets in people's heads than the first, is the stakes seem are really high to applicants. And let me give you an, an example. I have seen faculty members in meltdown mode because they've been applying for jobs at other schools stop me audience when this doesn't sound familiar and it's been 24 hours and the school hasn't emailed them back i have seen deans of law schools in panic mode when they've been applying for presidencies or provost positions and they've emailed the school and it's been two days and they haven't heard back completely unflappable people but the stakes seem high to them and they're not sure what the process is on the other side. So what's going to happen to a lot of people during the admissions process is almost, you know, the, the, the majority of applicants have something minor in the background. Is on the intellectual side, they know that having tried to buy a beer when they were 15 with their 12 friends probably wasn't a big deal. But on the emotional side, because the stakes are so high, what I think a lot of applicants are saying is, oh, my goodness, is this the one thing that's going to trip up my application? Thanks for that, Mike. Um, along those lines of uh, you started to talk a little bit about examples. What I would love to do is throw out a few specific examples, sort of hypothetical character and fitness situations, and then get sort of all of your impressions of how serious is this? How much would this impact my view of the applicant, given that you were all in law school admissions offices, reading these files, assessing the character and fitness? So I'd love to just throw out some examples. Um, And of course, we don't know how these hypothetical people would have actually written their addendum. So, you know, feel free to note, you know, if they had written their addendum this way versus that way, that that's fine, but I'm not going to go into any specifics of that. Um, Okay, so the first scenario is very similar, and I think uh, a lot of these are going to sound familiar to everyone on this call because you've read a lot of character and fitness addenda, uh, and they're much more common than I think a lot of people think. Uh, A lot of people have character and fitness addenda. Um, So the first scenario, uh, an applicant has two speeding tickets and a ticket for an illegal right turn on red, all from within the last few years. They paid the fines and don't have anything else on their record. How much is this impacting your view of this person? Anyone? Not at all. Not at all. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So we can all pretty much agree it's not going to be an issue. It's not an issue, but I I do want to point out just because it is, some schools will say that they don't need to disclose traffic violations. Definitely. And some schools will want to see it. I know it sounds ridiculous to, to talk about speeding tickets on your law school application, but it is important to follow the rules. I sound like such a, you know, you have to follow the rules, but you do. But having, you know, one, two speeding tickets, three speeding tickets. I mean, even I've seen applications with multiple speeding tickets and, you know, you can be a bad driver and still be a good lawyer. So I think (laughs) those are kind of things. I mean, they're they're obviously shades of gray, uh, but I think it's you know the the having a lead foot is not a, a barrier to the legal profession. 
Yeah, I think people are sometimes surprised that they have to disclose traffic violations at all. And then when they say, oh my gosh, I do, I do have several traffic violations. Is this going to be a problem? The answer, even if you have to disclose it, is still no, for the most part. Of course, shades of gray, as you said. Um, anyone else have anything else to say on sort of the traffic violations sort of thing? Then let's move on to our second scenario. Okay, um, this is another one I think is going to sound familiar to you all. An applicant was having a small get together with friends in their dorm during their sophomore year of college and there was alcohol in the room. They claimed that they were not drinking the alcohol. It was just in the room, but they were caught and everybody in the room was written up. Formal warning from the school, no, no criminal charges or anything like that. Thoughts? <laughs> One incident is not going to be a big deal. I lived in college dorms as a dorm parent for five years. Um, this is incredibly common, and it's one of the most common things we will read on character and fitness responses. Just be honest and straightforward, and you're reporting what you were asked, but it's not a big deal. I, I think the, the part that kind of tickles my ear is the part about everyone was in the room and got it and like I, I guess i would definitely want to hear ownership at some point in the disclosure you know yeah you were in the room yeah there was alcohol but yeah you were in the room and yeah there was alcohol and if you're not taking ownership now with this very minor thing what what are you going to do later in life i totally yeah. agree with you nathan it is um you know if you blame if if that came with an addendum that blamed everybody else and didn't take ownership that would be viewed a little differently Definitely. Uh, so I think the maturity and, and looking back at it, it's the offense itself is not a big deal. Yeah. And probably, well, I don't know, I really don't know, statistically speaking, but it's highly likely that the person reading your application may have had a drink before they turn 21. So <laughs> there may be a little bit of human relation there that uh, that plays in as well. Definitely, definitely. My only addition would be, this is one of those questions where the truth is almost always on your side. So if you were drinking, say it. Because the school's not still not gonna, if it's one of these or two of these, you had two parties in your dorm. As Karen mentions, a lot of deans of admissions that we know, a lot of directors of admissions that we know, probably had a drink or two when they were college students. If you weren't drinking, then feel free to say it, but the truth is on your side, so just say the truth. So let's move on to our third scenario. An applicant was charged with minor in possession of alcohol that was ultimately dismissed and expunged three plus years ago, but they also have a DUI from two years ago that was then pled down to reckless driving, starting to get a little more complicated. They paid a fine and did some community service and it is now done with. Any thoughts on that? That's, a, that's an interesting one. <laughs> um, you know, there are some schools that are will ask very specifically for expunged records, which I, I I personally have qualms with that, but they're asking that question. And, and so you want to be very careful with how the questions are presented. I, you know, should you go out of your way to hide this and obfuscate it? No. Um, you know, you still want to have that, you know, that policy of erring on the side of caution because it becomes a bigger issue if it's not taken care of at the offset. Will these elements prohibit you from going to law school? No, but the way you talk about it, the way you handle it, the way you express it can impact the overall decision. I think this does go, this is a little bit more of a gray area. I don't think that those two incidents alone are, they, they don't cause that many they don't raise as many red flags. I mean, the DUI that you know that could be. There are some tricky points there, um, but what Nathan said is absolutely. If, if they are asking, please include expunged things. Do not take the advice of a lawyer that has told you not to disclose it. Read the application and and disclose what is asked. That is. I, I can't stress that enough because we, we all have seen people get advice from schools, from lawyers saying that, oh, if it's expunged, you don't need to, you don't need to disclose it. But if the application is specifically saying you must include, uh, you know, issues that were expunged, you need to, you need to disclose it. It's just going to cause more problems later down the road. Any thoughts to add, Danielle or Mike? 
Yeah, the one thing that I will add is just going back to the the concept of this question where somebody's got multiple things that right. are kind of building on each other. Mm -hmm. That is something that the admissions officers are going to be paying attention to. Um, it again, like Karen said, it isn't necessarily a red flag if you have three things, therefore you can't get in or anything like that. But they're trying to get a sense of your character and your fitness for this. And so when there are thematic recurrences of something, there is a question of whether or not you um, ignore loss. <laughs> if you um, have an issue with something, it may be that as you build those things on top of each other, that the admissions officers are going to be paying attention to it a little bit differently. So you might want to be prepared if you're applying to a school that does interviews to be prepared that you might get asked that question in the interview to get a little bit more of a sense of what's been going on. Um, the further away you are, from the occurrences is also going to have an effect on how much it really matters. Um, if you're, you know, 10 years out of college and, and all of those occurrences happened way back when you were, you know, 21 and stupid, nobody's going to care. If they were all this past summer, I think they're going to care a little bit more. So the whether or not we're talking about alcohol or we're talking about other types of issues, I think when you are building on top of them, that's where um, it's not the actual incident, it's the trend that's going to be paid attention to. So, and not just as far as when Danielle mentions, you know, how, how removed you are from the incident, for sure timeline, but also what space are you in? I can think of a applicant I got to know years ago who had three of those of, of similar ilk, three alcohol, you know, I think two were uh, at least as severe or more severe. And it wasn't so much that this applicant was, you know, five years removed, but this applicant now had a family and a child and a 4.0 since the child. Their whole life was just 180 degrees different. And they expressed that and they're, you know, or they were at a wonderful law school with, with three of those, not two. But I think more generally when we, think about substance abuse within the profession, you know, a pattern, a sustained pattern of substance abuse, whether it's driving or, you know, arrests, that always creates issues when it's more recent even, you know, so if you have drunk driving, drunk driving, drunk driving, and then you write an addendum that says, you know, I've gotten past that, and then you have a drunk driving after that as well. It, it, right. it's, there's problems with that. And, and while it might be create kind of red flags for admissions committee members with time, you know, that can, that can rehabilitate you in the eyes of an admissions committee. So while, you know, something that happens, you know, within the summer before you attend law school, um, that wouldn't be a good look. But if it's, you know, two years or three years removed, that then changes the narrative as far as where you are in your life. And that also says that law school, you know, with the stressors that are coming for you, probably not a good idea if you have, you know, this substance abuse problem that you, you, you may need to have addressed. Yeah, that's a very good point. I do think that some admissions officers from talking to you all see it as, you know, we want to make sure that we're not setting you up to enter law school and have these significant problems that you've had issues with in the past. All right. So just to, to drive that point home, Anna, the admissions officers don't want to set people up for failure. And that is, I think a lot of, you know, more, more broadly beyond the character and fitness, but, you know, since we're talking about character and fitness, I think that's really important to note. The, the ABA actually, ha I can't remember the exact wording of it, but in the admissions portion of the ABA guidelines, it basically says that admissions officers should not be setting people up for failure. Right. So this, this is a part of, you know, the role of an admissions officer. Um, and that is something to take into consideration as well, because there are, you know, there are going to be stressors in law school and, you know, people who, there are lots of people who have overcome substance abuse issues, but there are some people who this might be a triggering event for a relapse. And so those things and being sure that that's something that is behind you and you take ownership of it and you can understand warning signs. I think those are things that are going to be really important because, you know, at, at the end of the day, admissions officers really feel strongly about that. They don't want to set people up for failure in law school. Anything else to add on sort of this issue? It sounds like 
this specifically might not necessarily raise huge red flags, but if it were a trend that continued, if there were another one of these, if they were really recent, it would start to raise some red flags. Is that an accurate summary of kind of what we're thinking? Okay. Um, all right. So the next one we have is uh, about academic dishonesty, which I think is a different sort of topic than like a criminal charge. Um, so here's an example. An applicant worked together with a friend on an assignment for a college class. They claimed that they thought that they were allowed to collaborate for the assignment, but they received a written sanction for academic dishonesty and an F for the paper. Any thoughts? <laughs> So I'll go back into a little bit of what Nathan was um, talking about earlier, which is how you write this is actually probably going to be the most impactful on how I would see it. Mm -hmm. um, taking a honest approach to it and taking ownership of what was done um, is a really important part of the evaluation that I'd be reading. Um, this is one of those places where I always say to people, stop using the passive voice. You didn't receive an F, you earned an F. Um, you know, these are the things that you need to be willing to say, I did this and here were the results of it. Um, if I read a character and fitness response where the person is saying that they were charged with academic dishonesty and is really still not taking ownership of it, I have a little bit more concern when I'm reading that application. Again, this is another place where how far away you are from it is also probably a bigger impact. And I may pay a little bit more attention to what the letters of recommendation are saying Mm -hmm. um, and looking for any um, any insights there about um, their ways of working with other people. So. I saw a lot of nodding. It sounds like everybody, it seems like everyone seems to kind of concur with what Danielle was saying. So, I mean, this is, it's a little bit, you start to get into the the fitness part of, you know, the character and fitness for the practice of law. Um, you're also applying to an academic program. So academic dishonesty is, you know, it's it, it's tricky. It's a little bit more serious. It hit, hits a little closer to home for a lot of people who are reading the applications. Um, and I don't say this to panic anyone. It's just, I, it's really not to panic, but it is how you own up to it, you know, to echo what Danielle was saying, I think how you own up to it and how, you know, the circumstances surrounding it, I think are going to be, really important there's no you know you can't you can't always predict how somebody is going to react to what happened especially if there's a faculty admissions committee mm -hmm. and they might see things a little bit differently um but you can take control over how you um you know how you how you speak about it and how you own up to it um i, I also think that in some cases the dean of you know whatever it is that you know at the school has written on behalf of the applicant saying, you know, about how, how sorry they were, or, mm. you know, how disturbed they were with themselves over this. Um, those kinds of things can help and speak to the overall character of, of the applicant as well. Or like, even if you say yourself that you're sorry and deeply disturbed, yeah. sincerity is very important. Mm -hmm. Versus saying, you know, hey, I really thought that I was allowed to work with my friend, so I think that this was not a right thing for me to be charged. That's completely different. Yeah, the second part of what you just said would be the problem problematic part of that statement. And if you zoom out to all four of the things we've covered so far, just to um, assure everyone, the gate, the drawbridge to the castle is not pulled up on any of these four. Right. But if you want to get that drawbridge pulled up, start blaming other people. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's where applicants kind of miss the mark. The event happened. They had the DWI. They had the academic dishonesty. But for some reason, they feel obligated to relitigate whatever happened. Mm. There's already a final outcome. The, the, the school or the, you know, the, the courts have adjudged you whatever it is that you were adjudged. But you have, there's this, again, sense that I need to now give you more context or give you more information. And at the end of the day, there's a final disposition. There's a final outcome. Just just stick with the information as necessary. And, you know, that that's, you know, a, a, a better policy than trying to relitigate or to give that, you know, explanation that isn't ultimately in the record. I'll add one thing about writing your character in fitness. Very few people need to write 
much of a response. Um, that what we've talked about here is that so many of the issues that people do have to respond yes to are very, very minor. And um, so two or three sentences are probably going to cover it for quite a lot of people. Yeah. Um, when you are talking about something that is um, more extensive or needs the context of how far away you are from it or something like that, you should be writing a little bit longer. But I always think that it's important for people to realize that everything that they're putting into their application is building a story about yourself. And it would not benefit you to make the story about yourself be primarily about that one thing that you're least proud of. Mm -hmm. Instead, make sure that your personal statement, that everything else that you're adding and is talking about how you add value to that institution, make sure that that's what shines through more. The habit for a lot of us is when we are uncomfortable with something that we've done, we explain ourselves a lot. We talk mm -hmm. a lot more. We write a lot more. This is not the time to give into that type of um, uh, bad habit. Um, mm -hmm. This is the time to be clear, to be concise and to acknowledge that you bring other things to the table and let those things shine through your application as well. It, to piggyback off that, in year one of this firm, someone reached out to me who had been denied to their dream school, which was a top 10 school that they wanted to go to. And they sent me their application. All we did, I mean, it's a different cycle too, so you have to control for that variable, which I don't remember. But all we did was take a three-page character and fitness statement and turn it into a one-page character and fitness statement. And that applicant was admitted to his dream school that next cycle he reapplied. Any other thoughts on sort of the academic dishonesty, character and fitness issues in general? You, you may want to expect a slower cycle with anything to do with academic dishonesty. I think people are going to double-click that character and fitness essay and see how you handle the situation. Kind of like Nathan was saying, if, if you have a three page explanation of what happened, it's probably two pages too long. It's a very good three point. And a half, three and a half pages, maybe. Um, <laughs> the only other thing that I will say is that there's a lot of different academic dishonesty levels of, you know, collaborating with a friend by accident or not. Um, there are, there are other things, I mean, just flat out cheating on an exam, uh, you know, stealing things, hacking into computer systems to change grades. I mean, there are, there are things that will pull, pull up a drawbridge, but, right. you know, there's, I, I think the academic dishonesty stuff is, um, can be a big can of worms in a lot of cases. Definitely. That actually brings up what I was kind of going to go to next, which is, I, I think we've been talking a lot about how, you know, if you address these things properly, they're probably not going to, you know, make law school not a possibility for you. They're probably not going to be all that serious and, you know, depending on how you write about it and those shades of gray that we've been discussing. Um, but there are those character and fitness issues, those, you know, Mike, if you're getting 99% character fitness, character and fitness issues that are zero issue at all, there is that 1% that they are a big deal. They They can be uh, significant barrier to you getting into law schools. Um, and so I kind of wanted to throw that out to the group. What sorts of things would fall under that umbrella? Embezzlement. <laughs> I think that things that are, I mean, you, if you're, you're thinking about character and fitness for practice of law, I think that if you're going to be, you're going to have clients that are going to trust you. I think, you know, in that kind of dishonesty of embezzlement or stealing, uh, money from someone else. I think that's, that's a, that's going to be a, a, a big problem. Yeah. I think felonies and um, big issues, big <laughs> issues can be a concern. Um, one of the things that I would suggest to anybody who has um, uh, something that has largely changed their life, right? I think that that's one way to kind of mm. put a, a circle around it. Um, is if it's li largely changed your life, taking a look at what the um, the bar is going to be like for you to pass and the states that you want to practice would be good for you to be able to see what they're going to pay attention to as well. Um, and you know what? You can Google and you will find people who have become lawyers after um, very difficult things in their world. Absolutely. Um, but they worked really hard to get there. 
And I think that that's an important thing for you to recognize is when you do find that really great article on whatever newspaper it was that talked about this person with a felony in their background or with the embezzlement in the background or something like that, they're really far away from what it was that happened. They've really done a lot of things that um, make people believe in their character and fitness at that point in time. Uh, So if it's something that's really changed your life, your life has to have changed by the time you are doing the application process to law school. I mean, when Danielle and I were were at Harvard, we admitted somebody with with a felony, a a serious felony, a carjacking felony. Um, And we admitted him at Harvard. He chose to go to Yale and he has since graduated from Yale instead. Um, (laughs) Which means he got admitted to Yale too. (laughs) Right, exactly. Um, But, you know, his story was remarkable. So I- he he's one of those (laughs) those articles that are out there um he had to petition to pass the bar though uh he Mm. had a long way to go to get through everything and um so that's an important part to it is it really has to be something you want to fight for and if it is keep fighting for it and i have a good example of that there's a law school faculty member who teaches criminal law who i'm not going to say the school or his story but he was a I believe a 12 year convicted felon serving time in prison for armed robbery. So again, there's shades of everything. There's always going to be your side of the story, the other side of the story, and then sort of in the middle is how the law school processes it. But the law school is more often than not going to, not going to process anything at that absolute other side of the story. They're going to listen to you too. So we've talked about sort of the less serious character and fitness issues. We've talked about the more serious character and fitness issues. But something that I think would be maybe helpful for folks to get some perspective on what this actually looks like when you are an admissions officer, of all of the applications that you read when you were reading applications in a law school admissions office, of those that had a character and fitness yes answer and a short description and addendum, how many of those actually impacted your decision on the application? It's, I can think of at least two people out of the, you know, roughly 12,000 applications I've read. I can also say so, probably one hand in the wow. five years I was at Harvard Law School. Um, wow. Again, it's something that we're looking at with the rest of the application. Um, and not everybody who has a character in fitness gets in, right? But the people who are competitive, it really wasn't what um, what was our final decision at all. I can think of... Um, I, I, I remember more clearly one person in the 12 years that I was at Harvard. I mean, there may have been others, but this was somebody that perhaps otherwise would have been admitted. Um, but it was a, a significant um, academic dishonesty issue. Yeah, I can think of two. One where there were three DUIs and no explanation. And one where the applicant lied to us. We we had made a decision and then we caught the applicant in a lie. Mm. And then we then of course that's when the drawbridge got pulled up. I'll end on this happy note. I can think of one character in fitness that helped the applicant. <laughs> they were caught trespassing. Doesn't sound great so far, although <laughs> I could all but guarantee the other three former admissions officers on this thing would say that's not a huge deal in a cemetery reading Harry Potter with their friends. What was every Dean of admissions on the road doing at that time years ago, (laughs) they were traveling and everyone was reading Harry Potter. And I remember hearing this story from the person telling me the story. I remember saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Write a page on that. (laughs) That seems like a good place to end for me. (laughs) Thank you, everyone, for joining into this discussion. And uh, for everyone watching, I I hope this was helpful. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.